So yeah, again, hello everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. We would like to welcome you to the first live reflection session of the Sharing European Histories self-guided course. Uh, this session is part of the Sharing European Histories project, which is an initiative of the Evans Foundation and EuroCLIO, the European Association for History Educators. Throughout the Sharing European Histories project, five teaching strategies on European history have been created by a team of researchers, teachers, and uh, curriculum developers. And all these strategies are now currently available on the EuroCLIO website in nine different languages. And five more uh, translations will be, yeah, these will be added very soon. And in addition to these live reflection sessions, the self-guided course also consists, sorry, three live, uh, live reflection sessions. This course also consists of five uh, recorded sessions. And in these uh, uh, recorded sessions, my colleague Birgit and I dive into um, yeah, the lesson plans that uh, local teachers and local experts around Europe have created. Two of them are actually here with us today, Anna and Yudai. Uh, so very nice to, to see you online. Um, so yeah, during these sessions, we uh, they, they present their lesson plan and show how they have used the different teaching strategies to create and execute their own uh, lesson plans in, in the classroom. My name is Eugenie and I'm EuroCLIO's uh, operations coordinator and the project manager of Sharing European Histories. And uh, my colleague Birgit is right here next to me. And together we will dive into the teaching strategy on stories of the past. It's titled Using Stories of the Past to Teach Students About Its Complexity. Uh, this teaching strategy is developed by Helen Snelson. She's also here with us today. And during this um, session, we will reflect on the teaching strategy together with Helen. Um, perhaps, Helen, could you uh, yeah, briefly introduce yourself? Yes, hello. It's lovely to see you all. I, I think it's the first time I've done a Zoom meeting with a dragon, which is fascinating as well. <laughs> you can see that. <laughs> <laughs> My name, as you can see, is, is Helen. Um, I'm based in York, um, which is in England, and I spend most of my time training history teachers in England now. I taught for 20 years um, history in English schools um, to students of 11 to 18 years old. Um, and I've been working with Europeans since 2013, which is something I absolutely adore doing. We just saying before we arrived how exciting it was to go to Brussels a couple of weekends ago and see people again in 3D. I'm sorry we can't be together in person, but I suppose the miracle of Zoom is we can all get together on a fairly chilly November night as it is in the north of Europe and, uh, and be together. So lovely to be with you. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, so we will uh, shortly start with a very brief explanation. Birgit will uh, just quickly tell us uh, a little bit more about the, the teaching strategy, and then we will uh, have a nice conversation with Helen and uh, see what, yeah, what inspired her to, to develop this teaching strategy. We also have some questions prepared uh, for the audience. We will be using Jamboard for this, and we'll be sharing the link uh, later. Um, uh, while Birgit is explaining the teaching strategy, I will also be sharing the link to the teaching strategy in the chat, so you can also just have a look at the, at the strategy your, yourself. And at the very end, like I said earlier, there will be some time for you for, uh, yeah, for, for Q&A to us or to Helen, or perhaps maybe to Anna and Yurai who developed um, uh, their lesson plans in, uh, yeah, for their own local context. So, um, yeah, I, I'll give the floor to, to Birgit. Okay, so we're going to delve into a little bit of the background of the teaching strategy. Um, it's called Using Stories of the Past to Teach Students About Its Complexity. And the teaching strategy is primarily aimed at teaching diversity and also the multiplicity of history through gathering uh, varying life stories. So these life stories, they all have one common focus. They're either about the same time period or about the same events, but they're collected from individuals who maybe originate from different parts of the continent or different parts of one country, and they are from different sections of society. So from different ages, genders, sex, nationality, or, or ethnicity. 
In this way, the strategy provides nuance and also a platform for voices which we may not have heard before. It also helps students to see the difference between history and memory and to really understand that history is a constructive narrative. Additionally, uh, the collection of life stories could even introduce students to a topic that they are unfamiliar with or a period that they haven't yet encountered in their textbooks and help them to look for it um, and kind of beyond what is usually portrayed and what they've read about before. Crucially, this strategy demonstrates that despite the differences underlying the life stories, there are a vast amount of similar experiences which we all share. And um, without further ado, we're going to go into uh, the questions and have a little chat with Helen, the author of the strategy. Um, so to begin with, uh, we've talked a little bit about the aims of this strategy and also the buildup of the strategy. Um, and maybe some of you have already watched the recorded session, which came out on YouTube this morning. I'm curious to hear, Helen, uh, what was your inspiration about uh, the strategy? Why did you believe there was a need for it? And also, how did it come to be? Well, I'm really glad you asked me that first, because the main thing I want to say is this is in no way my strategy. Um, this is something which has been used successfully by many teachers in the past and as we all do I just stand on the shoulders of giants. So it was really um, a coming together of opportunities. Uh, Inika who's, who's here who's been a fantastic hero clear inspiration for so many of us. She and I worked on a project called Decisions and Dilemmas a few years ago um, when we were able to put um, a set of life stories together as part of that project. And it had worked very effectively. Um, and so we decided when the Sharing European Histories project um, came up that this will be another golden opportunity, if you like, to put together another collection um, that would sit on the, on the Euroclear website. So if you like, it was a two-pronged approach. One, to get some more content up on Historiana for Euroclear that people could use and dip into, but also to engage the community in a process of, of content collection. And secondly, to say, okay, well, this is the strategy behind it. Let's use this as a platform to say, hey, come on everyone, this is a good strategy that, that you can use. It's, it's got lots of potential, particularly in our rich community where we have this wonderful ability to reach out to people from across the continent and beyond. So, um, yeah, I hope that answers the question a little bit. Yeah, for sure. It's definitely built up over time and uh, perfected into something which now people can access. It's published on our website under the resources. Yeah. Yeah, in addition to that, uh, the, the lesson plans that our local experts uh, are, are creating based on the teaching strategies will also be available on the, on the resources. So you can have uh, a look at uh, yeah, very practical examples as well. Um, yeah, no, thank you, Alan. It's very interesting to hear the, the, the history of the, of the teaching strategy, um, if you like, and, uh, and how it came together. Um, Maybe focusing a little bit more on uh, the, the learning objectives on the yeah, of the teaching strategy more broadly. Um, and I, I'll just begin with, yeah, with, with the learning outcomes. Um, what did you want students to, to take out of the strategy? Um, in relation to their substantive knowledge, so if they're studying a particular topic, um, then it was about broadening, it was about diversifying, because I'm very aware, having been a teacher myself for so long, mm -hmm. we never have enough time. There's always too much of the past. Often the curricula we have to follow are still quite highly political. Mm -hmm. And there can be very much, to be frank, about white men usually of a particular class. Um, and this strategy offers a way which is not time intensive for teaching in order to enable students to see that the past is very diverse and that the actions which they learn about have consequences and they have consequences on people they are not something completely abstract um, or detached so that was one thing and then in terms of 
the history and doing history and thinking of history as a way that we create knowledge about the past, I think very much it can help us access that concept of similarity and difference within a time period. So what you alluded to in the introduction, um, the idea that depending on who you are as a person, mm -hmm. where you are in place, may make your experience of exactly the same event or happening different from somebody else's but at the same time there may also be similarities and actually to tease out some of the the complexity of that um i think it does it in quite a what i call sticky way and by that i mean um because stories are memorable mm -hmm. uh, it helps students to remember to stick things in their minds um, if we talk about history uh, through stories of, of people, and that, of course, could apply to both talking about how we do history as, about, as well as talking about the, the past. Um, and I think as well, in terms of trying to enable students to remember so much as they often have to for exams, if, again, we go personal, but we also pay attention to the period, the wider context, life at the time, then we provide what's sometimes called hinterland knowledge or wider knowledge or world building knowledge, which means that the individual events and people, dates that they have to remember, and which can be quite dry, again, have more chance of making sense to them and more chance of them building up a framework of understanding mm -hmm. so that they can move around within their knowledge and uh, start to make it their own. So those are my main hopes, I think. I think it's very interesting uh, what you say as a student, it's almost easier to remember stories about people instead of just kind of facts and events, because it's a lot, it's a lot more personal, it's about people directly. So I think in that way, students yeah, can definitely benefit. They don't feel that they're having to memorize something from a, from a textbook. Um, but it's, of course, not only students who, who can benefit from this teaching strategy. Uh, teachers also have a lot to gain. When, uh, when you were writing and developing the teaching strategy, what did you want teachers to get out of it? Um, well, obviously, there's a lot of overlap here with what I've just said before, mm -hmm. but I'm towards the teacher. Um, I think enabling teachers to... I think as history teachers, we always are very aware that the past is messy and complex and that there is a tendency to oversimplify. And, and to an extent, we have to oversimplify so that students can learn because they're only young. They haven't been on the planet very long. And even if they're quite high attaining students, they can become easily overwhelmed with the complexity of the past. But this, going in through the personal if you like starting at, the, at a micro level and then going out, I think gives an opportunity to enable students to see the messy and the complex without being overwhelmed. And that I hope is a bit of a solution for, for teachers in terms of, of um, worries that we may have about sometimes things becoming over, oversimplified and, and, and overgeneralized. Mm. So that would be one thing. Um, I think they lend themselves to being able to, again, to even quite young students say, hey, look, there are many perspectives because having looked at a set of life stories, you can say, well, what do you think this, you can keep referring back to them. You know, what do you think this person's perspective would have been on? And okay, there's a little bit of hypothetical in there, but, it, but it's to get across this point that um, we, we do use evidence-based imagination in history and also that we do want to open up the idea for our students that there can be many perspectives on an issue and something I certainly found was a, was a problem when I was teaching was that um, I mean for example if I was teaching um, oh Germany in the 1920s you know you get these statements the Germans what all of them all 50 million really you know and and of course that's not the case but but it's a way of of keeping um, the humanity, um, the complexity without without overwhelming people, mm -hmm. and I think that, I think that's really 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 important. So I think that's something I would add to what I've already said before. Really, that uh, you know, flip what I said about the students to teachers. Yeah, yeah, uh, and and perhaps maybe just a little bit going going 
back to, to the previous question, I think what's also um, uh, in, in, important is the, the ability for students to perhaps identify with the life stories. If you're talking about different, uh, uh, yeah, different people, different life stories, maybe of the same age as the students or someone with a similar background, um, I think that's also very valuable and it makes it um, yeah, sticky, but also very tangible in a way. Um, I think so. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's. I think that's really really interesting. Um, if this, this might be a little bit of a of a tricky question, um, because hearing the history of the teaching strategy, you've it's been in the develop in the pipeline for quite some time. Um, but yeah, we we were just wondering if he would have the opportunity to rewrite a strategy. Uh, is there anything you would you would change? Um, I don't think so much in the strategy because I think it's very, very adaptable. Yeah. Um, I think what I would do is say there are certain things which probably make it more likely to work. I think it lends itself to um, periods which are perhaps transition periods and potentially quite complex. So, for example, that period between end of World War II and settling into, dare I say it, the Cold War um, in, in Europe. It's a period that we often leap over quite quickly, um, inevitably, and yet it's a period which I'm sure in real time felt an awful lot longer <laughs> to, to people who lived through it, perhaps like our own times are. Mm -hmm. on now. So I would say that it is, it's perhaps important to emphasise that the, the strategy lends itself well to taking a moment with those transition points to say there are people here. And perhaps we can think about these people as we now go on to learn the next stage of, 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 of what we're going to learn in history. And, and I want you to think, students, about um, what these, how, the, how it might have been for these people, how, how things might have been experienced by these people, how they might have reacted to these things, how it might have, might have played out. So that's not really answering your question, but I think it's quite an important point to, to emphasise that perhaps that needs to needs to be really uh, thought of um, but I think otherwise no not in terms of not in terms of uh, changing it in terms of I think it has lots of potential to uh, fit into all sorts of areas I suppose the thing is that we did once we did try in the very early stages to reconstruct some life stories from further mm. so if you like outside living memory and it just didn't quite work it, it it think of it like a bell that you sort of chime it, it rang hollow it, it it needed that real life experience because i think um some of the ex some of the um stories we were trying to almost write back into the first person we suddenly realized were almost too interesting and one of the things about the two sets of stories we've put together now is that some of the lives are really quite boring mm. um, i mean you know they're quite mundane yeah. and or there's this huge event going on in world history and the person's life is really not that much shaped by it because they're very busy having children getting married or, but that's real um mm. yeah, I think again um we can often get carried away by the idea that everybody in a time period was was sitting watching the news um and of course that's not true even today and it certainly was never true in the days um before we all had news of instant instant scroll um, and sometimes ones that you know the personal in one's life does take over from the world event even even when there's lots going on you know there'll be people who remember the covid period for other things than covid yeah yeah i think i think it's very true what you say about what may seem important to us is different than maybe what was important on an individual basis back then for example when you went grocery shopping like what items were maybe hard to purchase and and which ones did you come across more easily things like this which you wouldn't think about but if you really look at the everyday life uh, then it all becomes yeah suddenly apparent um kind of really yeah sorry we can just add oh, that yeah. we make something of that in history because yeah. actually what we're revealing is that what we regard as signifying something to us what gives us meaning changes 
and, and what we may attribute as meaning and, and things that we may see as big changes historically with our historical perspective, maybe at the time felt more like continuity or perhaps the other way around. So I think, you know, this use, you, can, you can use everything as a history teacher to uh, get across the discipline. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and kind of what we regard or think of as important is maybe less important. Maybe we should just like let the people who are alive at the time decide what was important to them. That seems much more logical. Um, kind of related to what uh, Eugenia asked, um, but when you were developing uh, the strategy, of course, now it seems uh, quite perfected. Um, but did you come across any challenges when you were busy uh, making the strategy? And yeah, if so, did you? Uh, how did you overcome them? Well, this is the real beauty of, of this fabulous Euroclear network and, and the fabulous trainees um, at Euroclear because you can sort of start reaching out to people through the Facebook group and suddenly you can get people offering stories from across the continent and beyond. So what I would say to anybody who wants to develop using the strategy, develop their own set is it is a bit intensive to start off with. So if I was sitting in my department trying to decide which um, particular topic we were studying would benefit in the modern period from some life stories I would be I would be planning ahead and I would be thinking right I'm gonna you know literally phone friends on here or whatsapp friends in terms of the Euroclear network and take some time because it is a bit labour intensive at first um, however once you've done it of course you can then run it year after year after year you've got a resource in the bank and what I would also say um, is to overcome a challenge is to is to to do it on a you know a hive mind a group basis so to get a group together across the Euroclear network of course you, it, there may be times when it's very appropriate in an area to do something based very much more in a region or on a city or on a nation basis in which case you can use perhaps smaller networks but there is something lovely about having such a such a, a breadth to topics of multi-specific perspectivity I that word um, <laughs> so <laughs> I think um, Yes, it's a challenge in terms of time input at first, but the rewards definitely um, uh, are, you know, it, uh, huge. Um, and uh, it's something that we found people were really willing to do, which is great. Um, and it was also a lovely way of younger people engaging with people from an older generation and, and family stories were emerging, community stories were emerging which hadn't emerged before. So there's something about the process as well, which while it's challenging is also very rich. I think one thing I would just say is that inevitably you have to work a little bit hard to try and get um, as broad a view as you can. The advantage is that nobody claims that this is a representative view of the past at all. It's not meant to be. And that's really, really important to say. But at the same time, let's be honest, even on our Euroclear network, we're not necessarily, unless we hit lucky, tapping into the whole breadth of any society by any means. So you have to be a little bit careful that you're not just getting stories from entirely people who, shall I say, have been university educated or, you, you know, whatever, or a particular segment of a, of a society. But again, I was, I was quite relieved that it wasn't too hard to, to break out of that a bit. And as I say, I think the important challenge is, is not to actually set the strategy up to be something that it can't. It, it's not a historian's evidence base. It's uh, a classroom resource and it doesn't claim to be anything more than that. So I think that's quite important. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and maybe going into a little bit more uh, into the, the, the practicalities of, of, the street, of the teaching strategy, as you already mentioned, it's yeah, very easy to adapt and there is a lot of space for teachers as well to, to create um, uh, their own lesson plan. Just to, to help teachers on, on their way, um, how can this strategy be adapted to meet, let's say, different needs of students? So when it comes to uh, down to levels or pace of learning and yeah the, these kinds of, of, of differences yeah I mean I think it, it, it's twofold it's it's more in terms of firstly the collection of stories that you gather around the strategy yeah. um how many of those you include how um much text you include with each one 
um, whether you present that text in a shorter version or perhaps a segmented version, so piece by piece by piece, rather than giving students a whole screed. It's always possible, of course, it takes time, but once you've done it, you've done it. It's always possible to read text so that students can listen, um, which I know some colleagues have done, which is, which is great. Um, it would be possible to potentially film and record. So that's another possibility. So there are all sorts of ways around the issues, perhaps to do with literacy, to do with attention spans, things like that, to do with, to do with time, which, which are very adaptable. Um, but then also the other key area that you would vary is your level of questioning. Um, so the sorts of inference that you'd be expecting an older pupil to do, or the way that you'd be expecting a higher retaining pupil perhaps to retain and bring in more contextual knowledge, would be different sorts of questions than if you were working with younger or, or lower retaining students. So your questions would be much more concretely focused. Um, but that, of course, depends on what your learning outcomes are. It, it might be that your purpose is, is to simply give students a sense that the late 1940s, in this case, were experienced differently across the continent. Well, you'd have maps, you'd, you'd pick out the parts that showed difference, you could put them in bold or whatever, and that would be your focus. Whereas if you were setting off with a group who you knew had to do some real specialty in, in the Cold War, then you could really start to drill down and get them to um, even do some contextualising work themselves but with certain countries or regions to find out what was actually going on. What if you like the, the bigger historical context was to that person's life? So I think you can you can take it big, you can take it small, you can take it deep, you can take it shallower, but the, the main ways of doing that are, are obviously with the, the input text and then with the type of questioning and framing that you, you give it. Yeah, we can really see uh, that this strategy is, is very easy to adapt to, like you say, different contexts, but also you know different like levels of teaching um, for different students too. And I'm sure some educators and teachers are now curious and keen to uh, use it in their lessons. Do you have any kind of like last tips, takeaways or pieces of advice that you'd want to share with uh, teachers who want to use the strategy? Um, oh, I think um, don't be put off by the way that it that it needs does need a bit of setting up to be to be uh, there at first. I sort of said that a bit, but you know, do do draw on the network to to create it. But also let the let the lives speak. Mm -hmm. um, so be prepared to 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 go with where the children want to go. Um, it's one of those rare moments in history teaching, even if you can only create a lesson out of it before you start, say, a topic like the Cold War, of, of letting the children's in front of you's imagination really come to the fore. So so let that happen. Uh, and be prepared to take some risks with it, therefore, because they might ask you questions that you don't know the answer to. But that's OK. Showing our frailties all right and actually saying to them, hmm, I don't know, but I'll find out. Let's see what we can find out about that is is lovely. And it makes, again, learning a co-created experience. Um, so I would say, you know, enjoy it. That's my main bit of the advice. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your for your reflection, Helen. Um, I think uh, I think it's it's really really helpful for uh, yeah for any educator that wants to get started with the strategy. Um, and I'm sure we'll uh, yeah we'll discuss uh, uh, some things a bit further in detail as we go with the questions uh, that we have also prepared for the participants that are now here with us. Um, yeah, so just for, for the teachers who are here and, and anyone else who's interested to, to, get, uh, to get a little bit, uh, yeah, perhaps to get started with the strategy, we prepared a few questions that, um, uh, yeah, for perhaps a little brainstorm. And uh, I will be sharing the link to the Jamboard. So we'll be using Jamboard for this and you can just collect all your input um, uh, in there through, through sticky notes. I can share. Oh yeah, there we are. So as we go, I will uh, also be sharing my screen shortly. I can see a lot of people are are entering, so that's that's a good sign. It means you have access. Um, 
Yeah, so we, we, we don't have to go into all the questions, but maybe just uh, to start with a very generic one based on uh, what you have seen and also based on what you have uh, heard, and perhaps you are already very familiar with the project, um, would you use this strategy in your classroom? And if so, how would you execute it? This is a very broad and generic question, but perhaps maybe some first thoughts that, um, yeah, that you could use. I'll just uh, share my screen. So you can uh, share your input by creating a sticky note right here. So you can just click on it, uh, write down anything you would like to share, and then you just click on save, and then it will appear uh, on the sheet. So we can uh, just uh, yeah, have a look at all your all your thoughts and and some first ideas that uh, that you might have, or maybe even questions. So we'll give you a few minutes to, to think and we'll uh, see your, uh, your ideas and your sticky notes uh, coming in. So once again, this is where you can find the sticky notes. Mm -hmm. We see one coming in. It would be great to gather a collection of migration stories since maybe 1960 to and from and around Europe. How to avoid us and then rhetoric with rhetoric with using ordinary people's life stories. Would that be a, is that a question? So I think that's that's a very interesting uh, point raised. And Helen, also feel free to to uh, to react or uh, yeah, if you let's see on everyday life and specific periods, yeah. Over one, over two, full bar after full bar. Yeah, I think Anna uh, created um, a lesson plan based on life stories from the Second World War. So she put together different life stories um, uh, from that period to teach the complexity of history is very difficult but absolutely necessary. I use I use regular in my class in form of different bibliography and different perspectives. Yeah, I teach the history of Sri Lanka. First, I want to get acquainted with the material and strategies, and after that, I will see if I can use. Yeah. Yeah, and for uh, anyone uh, watching along, the link to the teaching strategy will be available in the description uh, below this video. Yes, I think it would be interesting to take such a controversial vote to see that despite the majority is achieved, the perspectives were on both sides of the vote. I would like to see and use a collection of different stories of people living in communist regimes. Yeah. Yeah. Or in just one communist regime. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's very clever because you can't assume that the lived experience was the same of everyone, no matter what communist state they were living in. 
each country kind of interpreted and followed by um, that ideology on different to different extents. And so everyone's experience would have been different despite it just being communism. Yeah, and also, yeah, different different stories of migration, um, I think is also a very, mm. very interesting one. Yes, the stories can reveal in an accessible way that people have many identities and that they overlap yeah. with others, yeah. I think that's, that's very crucial to the strategy. Yes, we're looking at differences between people's perspectives and their experiences, but we also want to draw upon, yeah, the overlap and and the similarities that we share. And so I think this is one really useful way of doing it. Yeah, definitely. There's some, some, very, um, some very good ideas in there. Perhaps we can, we can also have a look um, into the, the next question. And that would be, um, yeah, what, so while well, it already comes in here, what kind of topic uh, uh, would you use? Migration stories, for example, communist regimes, um, but may, maybe more practically, uh, where would you look for sources or what, where do you normally look for, for sources? Uh, if you would be gathering, I mean, Helen already mentioned um, just reaching out to people, uh, collecting, uh, collecting different life stories within your, uh, yeah, through your own network. Uh, but perhaps it would be also nice to share some some practices or some uh, sources. So when people end up on very different sides of a debate, learning their background can help us understand them better, mm -hmm. even if we still disagree. It's respectful. Yeah. I think uh, perhaps Anna, you could maybe also share uh, through the gem board how you find uh, how how you put together your life stories and how and where you found your sources. Maybe uh, Centropa, yeah. Personal stories saved by people's families, mm -hmm. yeah. I actually think, um, yeah, it's, it's not very common, obviously, but I do know of people writing down either biographies or historiographies of things that happened to them in their lives or m maybe to their families. And um, yeah, then you have these very kind of authentic recollections, not all too common, but they do exist um, in people's families, yeah. Yeah, also reading how you use the BBC collections, uh, yeah, which is, um, I think also very useful. Perhaps you could also share uh, these links uh, in, in the chat and they are mm. also available in, uh, in the lesson plan that, that Anna created. Um, let me see, this could be done as a project where students themselves gather their life stories if there was a, a lot of time. Yeah, mm. yeah. I think that's, that would also be a very interesting approach. What do you think, Helen, to get students collecting the life stories themselves? 
Um, it was me that wrote that one. Um, oh, it's, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's, uh, it's another possibility, yeah. Mm. No, I mean, it does It does change it a little bit yeah. um, because you wouldn't obviously necessarily get the breadth, although you might do if you're working in an international mm. school. Um, I was ex- I was surprised. I worked in a school um, a few years back where it wasn't an international school, but there were students with from from a wider background. Yeah. It was extraordinary how much we could get by just talking to grandparents. So it, it might be that you get less of a breadth, but at the same time, if you have lots of time, then you can actually involving the students in the process of collection it's a different thing but it's equally rich yeah just a thought yeah though it would also of course mean yeah like you already mentioned uh uh more yeah more time more more coordination uh yeah but it's it's uh, i think it's definitely very interesting Any other any other sticky notes? Any other thoughts? And then perhaps we can proceed to uh, to the to the Q and A. Yeah. Suggest we. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, it's nice to to have a little collection of uh, um, of, of thoughts of, of brainstorm together. Um, we will be collecting all these uh, all these sticky notes, and uh, we can also add that to the to the description um, uh, below the video to make sure that some ideas are are there. So, um, unfortunately, we are almost coming to an end. Um, we we have some time left. Um, so, if you have any questions about the project, about the teaching strategy. Uh, to to us or to Helen or yeah like I said or you maybe to to Anna who created a lesson plan for live stories then um, yeah you can just raise your hand uh, or just unmute yourself ask the question or perhaps post your question in the chat that's also uh, yeah. that's also possible yeah whatever you feel most comfortable with if your mic is also not working then it's great yeah. just to type uh, type a little text in the chat. I can kick off with uh, maybe a question I have uh, for Anna, um, because as you may have uh, seen already, Anna um, developed the teaching strategy and, and kind of adapted it to her own local context. So I'm curious about how you were able to gather different testimonials and different uh, perspectives you had already quite a lot when we were reviewing the lesson plan. Uh, so yeah, tell us a little bit more about how you yourself managed to, to gather those life stories. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yes. <laughs> uh, I say this because people don't know, but uh, while we had this recording session, I had problem with my mic. We had everything okay on our meetings, but when we get to the recording session, I had big problem with the mic. So I hope now you can hear me. Yes. Uh, I want to thank first to Helen for this uh, wonderful strategy. I had a chance to meet her at the Learning to Disagree project uh, at the seminar in Topola, and uh, we had a really inspiring workshop with Helen. So I really appreciate her work. I would also like to say hi to Inake. She was my first uh, person to inspire me to be in this world of history educators and to cooperate with Europeo. And I want to thank Birgit and Eugenie to you also for wonderful time we had and for the excellent job you, are, you have done so far. As you have said, uh, I have developed uh, 14 life stories. Uh, for the lesson plan about uh, everyday life during the Second World War. And uh, I put some links in the chat from BBC Collection and from Centropa. These were my first sources for the stories, but I also tried to collect some stories from people who I know. So some people uh, have shared stories of their grandparents from to, for me, and I adjusted them to be life stories for this lesson plan. I also used some handbooks, uh, like I mentioned, uh, from Pilatsky Institute, uh, from Poland and from CDRSC. 
Uh, I also used some collections from the internet and some YouTube for this because uh, you can search also YouTube. It's really full of sources. Uh, I used uh, one story from Russia, mm -hmm. from the YouTube, but there is plenty of sources also there and stories, witnesses, testimonies, so you can use also this one. But uh, as Helen has said, and I mentioned that in the recording session, it is really a big challenge to find sources. Everything else is easy, but that first step to find stories and to adjust them can be really challenging for history teachers, most, mostly for teachers like me who are at the beginning of their career. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, there is a... Uh, comment in the chat, Birgit, perhaps we can uh, read. Yeah, I'll read the read the comment out loud. So this one is from Kadalen. I hope I haven't pronounced your name too wrong. Um, it says, in my experience, sometimes comparisons, especially when it comes to real life stories, leads to conflict instead of addressing diverse experiences. If you have some tips about it, I'd appreciate to hear. Yeah, I, I can see that this would, would be the case. Um, Helen, do you have any thoughts on this? I think I think that's an interesting one. Um, it's so dependent on different groups of students, different topics, different collections of things. Um, I, I think in the end, it boils down to the, the individual teacher knowing their pupils and knowing a particular group. Um, I'm very much coming at this through a sort of teaching history approach. Um, and I suppose, yeah, if I was very much aware that something was too emotional and too controversial for students to engage with straight away, then I, I just wouldn't go in head on in that way. I would be choosing another approach, not to be avoidant, but in order to prevent closed minds so that no learning was taking place um but i'm interested I'd, I'd love i'd love to talk about it more and this is the real downside of of being on zoom and and, and i don't know whether you whether you could speak out with your microphones okay because my experience has been even with some quite controversial stories in some quite controversial places that actually starting with a personal perhaps starting with one story or two stories in fact i was just working on something earlier on um to actually start with the personal without any of the labels attached without any of the big picture to start with a human um, can be a way of opening up some quite closed minds mm -hmm. but obviously from what you're saying your experience has been different the thing I was working on earlier was something in relation to a Roma child person who in a classroom if presented the wrong way there might be immediately prejudices put you know people's minds were fixed but because of the way the story was introduced, that identity was not at the forefront. The personal humanity was at the forefront. But as I say, it's almost difficult to generalize because things are so, so personal. But I don't know whether, Cardellen, you could perhaps say more about the sort of context you're coming from. Uh, I'm from Turkey and I'm working as an adult educator. So uh, I think that's the case. Uh, if, uh, if I work with the children, uh, it's much more easier to uh, reflect on uh, diversities, but when it comes to adults, it's, uh, they have uh, like so much baggage, mm -hmm. you know, about the life stories. So uh, when, uh, when I uh, emphasize on uh, the differences between memory and history, especially the national, uh, history uh, it's uh, it's like uh, sometimes it's less to uh, conflict like that you know so uh, it, in this peak uh, I, I felt that uh, I'm not uh, able to uh, backward to it so that's the case I guess uh, that's about the adults I think I I think you make a very perceptive point. Adults are so much more defended. Their identities are more fixed, aren't they? And also, 
it's harder for an adult to read something with a fresh mind because they've got they've got they've got more knowledge and knowledge is not a bad thing obviously but it can lead to a fixed mindedness i mean the only suggestion i could say would be to connect into some of the euro clear work that was done by our colleagues in the western balkans um in relation to once upon a time we used to live together um and there'd be people in here who've got far more expertise in that project than, than i have but some of the things they managed to get conversations around were, were I believe, around objects um, and moments of shared childhood, which was potentially quite interesting. But I, but I think, you know, obviously, yeah, you're, you're right. With adults, it's a trickier thing. Thank you. It's really useful. Thank you. Yuda, I saw you had your hand up. Hello, good afternoon. Yeah, so do I ask the question? Yes, yes go for it. Hello, Helen. Uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, uh, I believe that, uh, like, or I think I see the strategy is highly inspirational, and I believe you have used and implemented it many times. But I would like to ask if there was any use that did not go well and, and why. <laughs> so I would like to ask if you can share with us some specific example, why the stories that you have chosen or specific steps that you have chosen went not that good and, and why and what you took out of it, what, what lesson you learned out of this and then to generalize upon it. Thank you. It's a really good question. I mean, I think picking up on Cardaline's point previously, there were always dangers which can happen with everything. And I haven't personally had that experience. So mine is going to be a lot more classroom kid based. And that's that I'm doing this because I want them to gain some knowledge that I will then use in future lessons. And you have to be careful that students remember, sounds terrible, but what you want them to learn, i.e. the bigger picture, the danger is they'll remember something really small and insignificant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's like, what? You know, it's like, oh yeah, she was the one that had the blue hat. And it's like, well, that's nice, but that's not really progressed your learning of history very far. And my mistake was not actually spending enough time with the questioning afterwards with the live stories to draw out the big picture, to emphasize the big what I would call takeaway points that I wanted to, them to take from it. And in relation to this, it was things about, um, there were differences between the experiences in Eastern Europe and Western Europe in the particular time period. There were, and, and so just to be careful that, um, yeah, the, 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 the big takeaway points they remember from the stories, you take the time to, to build that learning forward if you need that to happen, which I did. I needed them to walk into the Cold War period remembering about Eastern and Western Europe and things like that. And I got some memory about a blue hat and it was <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, it's like, I mean, that's OK, but it's not helping their history. That would be. Yeah. <laughs> I think we see a hand up from Inika. Inika, would you like to speak? When I, I'm certainly the oldest person here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. And, and now you're muted. I think you've gone okay. muted. Yeah. yeah, now you're good. I said, I'm certainly one, the oldest person here. And um, I can only give an experience which helped me. Um, the first um, coming together in the well in Sarajevo in the beginning of uh, 2000 no I think three three or four when um, Slovaks and uh, Croats and now uh, Bosnians and uh, Serbs etc came together and um, they all sat together in their own groups and I said I know you are adults but I teach you as uh, I treat you as students so I counted them the, the teacher's method of one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And I said, now four ones sit together and four two sit together. And that was for them very frightening. So I said, well, first tell, tell each other uh, who you are and where you, where you are and if you have family. So you start with, like Helen said, with the personal thing mm -hmm. uh, so that the other don't see you as a Bosnian or a Serb, but as a person. And then one person said, well, you know, this is the a Croat. This is the first time I'm in Sarajevo. Uh, I had my 
my military training here when it was still one country with Tito on the Tito. So that was one thing. And then another said, hey, I was there as well. So it started in the personal aspect. That was one. And secondly, I asked them, now the country was into pieces to remember from the period they were uh, to mention from the, the area they were from, some things that they want to be remembered by all when it was one country. So say something about the past from your perspective about that part of the country where you were in. I was not allowed, I was warned uh, by the Council of Europe not to use the word former Yugoslavia. So I spoke about and the part of the region you are in. So very carefully, not so that what it doesn't happen that one word make them blind. Mm -hmm. So keeping it open. And then I didn't want to mention that uh, these, well, situation or place of history or uh, music that could have all aspects. Um, say loud, so they had to write, write them down, not more than three in the beginning. And then what they did, they said like this, that the other didn't see what they wrote. And then I said, now you get a very difficult point. Don't talk with the other, but share with your neighbor the paper. It's, it's, it's a method, of course, but in this aspect, it was loaded and try not to tell, but that, that did not, was not successful. But immediately, they tried to explain to the other why they selected that place. Well, that was, an, or that situation, that was another way of communication, so I didn't mind. But then I said, now I asked the other person to write about what the neighbor wrote, to, to make a comment why you think he would have chosen that. And then there came sentences as, well, because there was a battle there and many people uh, of, of his, uh, uh, now other Serbs or other Bosnian Serbs were slaughtered. And they didn't, they didn't use slaughtered, but were, were, were killed or were dead. And then um, I did, it was with four, the other two had done that as well. And then they got it back and they read that and they wondered, hey, this is strange, but it was not in an, in an enemy-like enemy -like atmosphere. Yeah. And then it said, and now nothing about politics, but can you write down two things you share? And then there was for 10 minutes a silence. And then one person said, so it was heavy, one person said, well, maybe we must think what former Yugoslavia was like. Mm -hmm. And what I had said, no politics. And yeah. then it came with the music with a, a literature prize for a person. Um, now, in the end, also with food. I didn't say anything, but that was, it, it brought something, you know? Mm. And then I sent them out and they smoked their cigarettes and we drank something and that, that was a starting point. Mm. Okay, I wanted to share that experience with you to the, especially to uh, Cardelin who says, well, it is so difficult. It is difficult, yes, but not impossible. Mm. Yeah, no, thank you so much for sharing your experience. It's, it's fascinating to hear how there are ways to, to begin um, sharing and start a conversation. And you have to begin from a point of respect. And yeah, like, like Helen has said, like Inika has said, removing the labels, but also your example uh, is very interesting of having that piece of paper, which you then share with your neighbor you have to put yourself into the shoes of your neighbor to try to work out why they wrote that. Um, so yeah, this is really all great examples. I even you, were not, you see, Birgit, you were not compelled to write something down that you doesn't want. It is your choice what you want yeah. to write down. That was also important so they could own it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But no, very, it's very, very yeah. true and very thought provoking as well. I think we could have many discussions on this. Yeah. I, um, I also see that Maria left a, a comment in the chat, which I'd like to go on uh, further in on. She says that she um, invites sometimes former combatants um, from, the, from the colonial war into her classroom to give testimonies. And uh, I want to hear, is it different uh, or do students engage differently uh, with people when the story is spoken instead of when it's written down? And yeah, what are your experiences 
with this method. If you can unmute yourself, uh, if you want to talk, please feel yeah. free. You are talking with me? Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm very sorry. My English is not very good. No <laughs> um, and uh, uh, it's difficult to me to understand everything you are, you are saying uh, when you speak um, too fast. Um, I, I, I didn't understand the, your question. Yes, <laughs> Can of you course. Can you say again? I, I will repeat uh, the question. Uh, I'm I'm wondering when you invite the these people to come into your classrooms, mm -hmm. do you think that your students react or engage differently with these people because you're speaking about it and they can ask questions? And is that interaction, that conversation different than if they were to read about these stories? Yes, yes of course. Uh, um... Uh, you, you talk about the, the textbooks. They don't like textbooks. The, the students, mm -hmm. they don't like to read. It's a big problem in Portugal nowadays. Um, and when they, they heard, they, they, or they see the video about something uh, interesting, they, they, they learn uh, a lot. Uh, and they like to, 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 to make questions. Uh, um, for example, uh, the, have you have you have, have you um, um, let's say um, to kill someone in Africa in Angola for example mm -hmm. or have you seen some um, Portuguese combatants the be killed uh, and why why were you there and uh, it's uh, it's very good because um, uh, the, um, usually they don't understand the the reasons of the wars. For example, the, the, I, I talk about the, our war in, in Africa, uh, but also you, you talk about uh, the, the, the war in uh, Serbia, I think in the Yugoslavia and, uh, and the, the, the Second World War um, and, and so on. And uh, I think the debate begins, uh, it's, uh, it's better, they learn better and uh, they, um, they hear, and um, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I, I think it's a good strategy. And uh, I, uh, I, I know a lot of people in Portugal, there is the associations of uh, former combatants that they, they like to go to schools and uh, it's very, very, very good. And uh, when I can, I, I, I do it. Do it. <laughs> I don't know if I, I answer. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Yes, you Thank definitely you. did. I think it's a completely different way of engaging with history if you can actually speak to the people who yeah, live through those experiences. So I'm, I'm sure students also prefer a break from textbooks every now and then. And I think this is a wonderful way of doing it. Yeah. We are a little bit uh, over time. Um, are, there, are there any more questions? I think we have time for, for one or two more final questions. I think Anna has her hands uh, raised. I hope you hear me now again. Yes, I can hear from do. Mike. <laughs> uh, so I will have one short comment and one question for Helen, if we have time. Yes. Uh, about what uh, Cardinal and Jure said, uh, maybe we can use uh, some stories without anything in, that indicates uh, someone's nationality, age, and something like that. So maybe that's the way to have stories that students will like more, and they will, don't have uh, prejudices and something like that. And my question for Helen is uh, what she thinks about the sensibility of stories. By that, I mean on uh, some stories, for example, I had one story where a woman talks about rape. She Mm -hmm. leave that and um, I had one student at my class but I didn't know her mother survived also something like that so she took the story too emotional and I didn't have chance to know that in advance because the student is very in introvert how to deal with that what to do with stories in order not to be in that situation mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very, very good question as well. And sorry you had that experience. I think we've probably all as teachers been there and thought, oh gosh, I didn't predict that one. And, and it's horrible, isn't it, when you think you've 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 stepped on a on a on a human's emotions. Um 
I think that there is an age appropriate decision, of course. Um, I mean, I think one can generalize about age appropriateness. I think something else that I have always tried to do is introduce and say, sometimes we may encounter things which you find distressing and please be aware that sometimes what happens to people in the present day what's happened to people in the past is distressing and it affects us all in different ways and if any of you are upset by anything please feel free you know I'm here you can come and talk to me and um, you can um indicate in some way so you can stop try and sort of couch the ground in that way mm. I think it's important to create particularly with younger students, the sense of a safe space. So to say that some people may find this material more emotional than others, and we're not going to make judgments or start asking questions where people don't want questions or if they're younger children, you know, being inappropriate. And sometimes younger children might not be inappropriate for any malicious reason. It's just because they don't know how to to handle the fact that somebody is obviously feeling uncomfortable. So to make it possible, to make it okay for confidentiality, to make it possible to feel uncomfortable, to make it okay to feel human emotions. Um, but at the same time, yes, to look at material, to try, and, and as you so beautifully say, we don't always know exactly what's in our room, um, but to try and know the students, but and, and to try and make a judgment based on age, but also to look at stories and always try and present stories from a way which, which as we've been talking all this session keeps things very human and doesn't just present stories of people in as victims or, or in a position of being um, horrible, mm -hmm. horribly abused. We have this conversation sometimes in history about the need to be real, but also the need, particularly with young minds, for history not to be always so bleak uh, and actually to sometimes present the human hope and the human resilience as part of the story, because it's usually there in every story. Um, but again, those are just sort of suggestions and, and, and pointers in the general for something that's very hard in the specific. But I think the final thing I want to say is, is um, it will happen sometimes, but don't try not to be too hard on yourself about it when it happens to one as a teacher, because trying to be human is really important as well and, and actually the alternative is to is to never do anything that connects to the personal and then we're just robots so it it is a difficult balance yeah yeah thank you thank you very much uh anna for your question and uh to helen uh for for answering um i'm i realized that we have still uh I feel there is a need for more discussion, uh, but at the same time, I'm afraid we're really uh, running um, uh, out of time. So for now, uh, I would just like to, to thank Helen um, for this reflection session and thank you to everyone that is uh, here with us um, for, yeah, for all your input, for your questions and for the discussion that we, that we had at the end of the session. Um, so, yeah, the, I think this has brought us to the end yeah. of the, the first live reflection session on the, um, on the stories of the past teaching strategy. Um, like I said earlier, it is uh, part of the Sharing European History's uh, self-guided course, and all the different sessions are available on the Euroclio YouTube in the mm -hmm. Sharing European History's uh, playlist. So, um, yeah, once again, uh, yeah. Thank you very much, and uh, we we hope to to see you soon.